The Pokemon series is one of the most unique franchises to look at when it comes to representation in Smash Ultimate. While the main series Pokemon games do indeed have main characters in the forms of the trainers, they're far from the most iconic parts of the series. It's the stupid rat instead. So the trouble with representing Pokemon in the Smash series is that there are so many iconic characters. That's why we've gotten a new Pokemon in every Smash game, as there's constantly new and iconic ones being created. But obviously, not every iconic Pokemon can be included on the roster, no matter how much I wish I could play as Tangela. Luckily though, there are plenty of other ways to represent a character in Smash. There's spirits, of course, and Pokemon also get the Pokeball item, which can summon in a ton of different ones from the series. However, one other method of representation that you may not have thought of are the stages. For the most part, these are meant to represent locations, but Pokemon actually takes a somewhat interesting approach by having many of the stages implement other aspects of the Pokemon series, including the Pokemon themselves. So, welcome to another episode of Level by Level. In today's episode, I thought it'd be fun to go over each of the Pokemon stages in Smash to review how good they are as stages and representations of the series. I did a similar thing with the Mario stages a while back. In that video, I'll put each of the stages on a tier list, so I'll do the same here. This time though, there's of course much less to talk about, with there only being 7 stages. Each of the stages here do still have quite a bit of depth though, so I think this analysis will still be quite fun. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, at 200k I'm ranking every 2D Mario level, and let's jump right into the first stage. Our very first stage of the video originates all the way back from Smash 64, that being Saffron City. This is based on the location of the same name from Pokemon Red and Blue. Being the first generation of games, it makes sense for it to get a stage. This stage definitely has a pretty interesting layout. You can basically divide it into three separate sections. First is the yellow area to the left consisting of one tower and two flying platforms. Unfortunately though, the tower and platforms are both really small, it's kind of hard to do much of anything here. If you launch someone off to the left, you could very easily get them stuck since you can cover most of their options from the ledge without even having to try. I do like the platforms being here though, even if one of them is sloped. Speaking of the slope, that brings us to the next building in the center. Actually, I want to cover the right side first, get trolled. This is another tower like the left side, just without the extra platforms. The same sort of issues apply here, but this is placed up much higher than the other one is. Both of these towers are not connected at all to the building in the center, which on the one hand is pretty cool for characters with wall jumps. If Dr. Mario gets spiked down here, he'll have a chance to recover for the first time in his life. Sucks for Ness mains though, no PK Thunder for you. But that brings us back to the main building in the center. It's got a slope and a small wall, which can be annoying to some, but also leads to some pretty fun scenarios. Scenarios. Now so far we've only talked about this stage's layout, when do we get to see the silly pocket monsters? Well that's where we introduce this stage's main gimmick, the opening door. If played with hazards on, one of five Pokemon will be able to appear from the door. I think this is a good way to get some more representation into the stage and actually play into the series' main appeal. The first Pokemon is Chansey, who will throw out eggs as an item. Charmander is able to breathe fire by using Flamethrower. Electrode is able to explode. Porygon uses Tackle and deals about 18% when touched. Finally, Venusaur will use Razor Leaf, which will deal a bit of damage. That's a decent variety of Pokemon, though there is one tiny issue. Of the five Pokemon, two are part of the evolution line of a playable one, and Electrode is already a Pokeball summon. Now that's not really the stage's fault since it's a port from Smash 64 before those things were true, but looking at it now, there's not much here to represent new Pokemon. I guess you could include Butterfree, Fearow, Pidgey, and Moltres since they can appear in the background, but they don't really do anything. Still though, I do like the door gimmick, it's pretty well implemented and isn't too horribly intrusive, so I think overall this stage deserves a B tier. It certainly got a decent layout and gimmick, but it does have a few flaws holding it back. But now we get into what might be the first thing to come to mind when it comes to Pokemon stages in Smash, that being Pokemon Stadium. I've been showing Pokemon Stadium 2 footage. Yeah, so there are actually sort of two stages to talk about here, as they both have the same idea behind them. First, we could talk about the hazardous versions of these stages, as they're pretty much exactly the same. Um, actually, the platforms on PS2 are slightly higher since Kirby doesn't land on them with his forward throw. Really embarrassing mistake. Yeah, so both of these are just a flat stage with two platforms. This provides for a very good layout for fighting, so much so that PS2 is one of the game's legal stages in competitive play, and one of the most popular ones at that. Now looking at these two, you may be wondering, what are they based on? Um... Yeah, it's just supposed to represent a general location where a Pokemon battle would take place. With the big crowd, most likely something similar to the tournaments in the anime series. Now to some, the lack of a concrete reference may be a bit of a downside, but in my opinion, I think it works well here. It does feel fitting for the battle scene in the Pokemon series, but it also lets them make a pretty creative gimmick. Now it's about time we look at the hazard version of these stages, which are where the real differences start to show. After battling for a few seconds, the stage will change into one of four different layouts, each being based on a different Pokemon type. The selection of four types is different between PS1 and PS2, so let's look at the original first. The four types here are Grass, Water, Fire, and Rock. The first three are the types for every starter trio in the series, so their choice here is perfect. And there's also Rock. Starting off with Grass, it turns the area into a small forest. There are a few wooden platforms in the center now, and the ground at the bottom is a bit more hilly. Of the four, this is definitely the simplest, but I think it works well for the typing. Water makes this a bit more exciting by having a windmill at the left and two platforms at the right. The windmill will spin as you play, so while you can stand on it, it is a bit of a challenge. The right platforms are also being held up by water, which I think is pretty cool. Fire is definitely my favorite looks-wise. It turns the 
ground into this really dark red color. On here, there's a burned down house you can use as a platform. Pfft, wouldn't want to be the guy that lived there. There's also a tree which acts as both a wall and a platform. While walls can sometimes be annoying to fight around, I kind of like it here to mix up the layout. Also in melee, it's funny because you can glitch through this stage and die. Finally, we have the rock transformation. This one is probably my least favorite just because of the giant mountain at the left. It can be very annoying to climb up, easily putting one player at an unfair disadvantage. There are also a few extra platforms here, acting as good bits of variety. Now that's it for the PS1 layouts, but there's still PS2 to look at with four other types. The four types here are electric, flying, ground, and ice. Definitely a lot more random than the first, I'd say, but that's understandable since the first obviously already had most of the major types. Electric definitely makes sense to get a variation, so seeing it here is pretty fitting. This has the interesting gimmick of having two conveyor belts spawn in to go towards the ledge. That obviously makes fighting a bit trickier, but I think it was a pretty creative way to implement the typing. A few platforms also spawn here as well. One other addition I like that wasn't in the original Pokemon Stadium is that Pokemon actually appear in the background now. In the case of Electric, we get to see Magnezone and Electrovire, evolutions for Gen 1 Pokemon introduced in Gen 4. While they don't do anything themselves, I think that's absolutely a nice touch as it gives some more Pokemon representation. Onto flying, this layout may seem like the most simple of the bunch. It just slightly raises the floor with mini skill slopes at the edges. However, this does actually have a pretty big gimmick of when pushing the characters upwards. This makes everyone fall much slower, completely changing how you have to fight on here, which I think is again pretty creative. In the background, we also get to see Drifloom, Hoppip, and Skarmory. Now, ground type I'm kind of mixed on. The layout is fine with the dirt mound and three platforms, but I don't know, I think ground is a really lame choice. To me, rock and ground are the most similar Pokemon types, so I would have liked a more original choice like Ghost or something. Still, the layout is fine here. In fact, I do like it more than Pokemon Stadium 1's rock. Doug Trio and Cubone also appear here, with a really cute Helix fossil reference in one of the rocks. Finally, Ice's gimmick is pretty obvious. It's slippery. I don't really think it needed to be anything else, though, so it's pretty good. Snover and Snow Runt appear in the background here. Also, there's a cat picture in the shed, which totally goes against the Pokemon canon. This is an F-tier stage. Okay, but seriously, I really like the approaches both of these took. The typing system is a very important aspect of the franchise, and this was a great way of representing it. Add on that it has a fantastic layout in Hazardless 2, and I think they both deserve to be an S tier. I prefer PS2 because of the Pokemon appearances, but both are definitely great stages. Alright, back to stages actually based on locations in the games, we have Spear Pillar. This is from the Generation 4 games Diamond and Pearl, and is the location where you catch each game's respective legendary. That makes it a pretty fitting location to represent those games, but how did the Smash team do adapting it? There are two layers here, an underground and a surface. Both are perfectly flat, with the surface having two additional platforms that move up and down. Now, the underground portion does make it unviable for competitive play, since you can live for a really long time through teching on the ceiling, but in a casual match, I think that could be quite fun. What isn't fun is that people could easily circle camp in this stage, as they could just switch layers whenever they they want. So make sure if you are going to play here, you don't play against a Sonic main. So it's got an alright layout, but what about the stage's hazards? While six Pokemon can appear here, the only three of them actually do stuff. Mesprit, Azelf, and Uxie just make cameos, but them being here is cool regardless since they are also legendaries from Gen 4. The other three Pokemon are Dialga, Palkia, and Cresselia. These all fit pretty well here being Gen 4 legendaries. Palkia is also a Pokeball Pokemon, which is unfortunate, but he definitely needs to be here since this is where you catch him in the games. As for their attacks, let's go with the ones Dialga and Palkia share first. They can tilt the screen, cause an earthquake, which actually breaks part of the surface platform, and finally they can fire a laser. This can either take out the cave area or shoot vertically to destroy parts of the surface. These are sort of chaotic, but not the worst gimmicks in the world, especially since they help prevent circle camping. As for exclusive attacks, Dialga is able to slow down time. Palkia is able to half the gravity and weights of all fighters, mirror the screen, and flip the screen like his Pokeball summon. Those attacks fit their themes of time and space pretty well. Cresselia would just shoot out various different crescents. Honestly, I kind of forget it can spawn here. And also, I forget it exists at all. So yeah, those can be a bit chaotic, but they fit their Pokemon pretty well. I think Spear Pillar definitely deserves to be another B tier, for similar reasons as Saffron City. It has a decent layout and decent gimmicks. Personally, I like playing on Saffron a bit more, though. Unova Pokemon League is currently the only Pokemon stage in the game to be based on a generation without a fighter on the main roster. Currently, that consists of Gens 3, 5, 8, and 9. Unova is, of course, Gen 5 from Pokemon Black and White, so it's cool that this region was still able to get represented. This is based on the Pokemon League of that game, being the location where you fight the Elite Four. That's obviously an important aspect of every Pokemon game, so its inclusion fits right in. For the layout, this is actually a really good one, being a flat stage with two platforms again. In my opinion, this would work extremely well as a competitive stage choice. But oh no, the Palutena mains can't recover because the rocks make it slightly harder they can't possibly recover at a different angle. Anyway, as for the hazards, this is a very similar idea behind it as Spear Pillar. Five different Pokemon are able to appear in the background of the stage, though three of them, Whimsicott, Shaman, and Melotic, are just for aesthetics. Shaman and Melotic are kind of weird choices since they're from Gens 4 and 3 respectively, but hey, I can't complain too much about getting to see them. The two that actually affect gameplay are the box legendaries, Zekrom, and Reshiram. Zekrom is able to shoot out Electric-type attacks, which are both able to tilt the stage and destroy the ramps that come in at the sides. Reshiram uses Fire-type attacks, which just cover portions of the stage. Not the most exciting hazards in the world, but they work all right. So in the end here, I think this stage deserves to be an A tier. It's got a fantastic hazardless layout, but its hazards are much less creative than the ones we saw in the Pokemon Stadium stages.
Now it's time we get to our two Gen 6 stages. Excluding the Pokemon Stadium since their origins are mostly unknown, Gen 6 is the only game to get two stages based off of it. While Pokemon X is my favorite game, <laughs> because it was my first, I personally would have liked for them to replace one of the stages with the Gen 3 stage, since it doesn't have a Pokemon on the roster to represent it. But how are the Gen 6 stages themselves? Well, starting off here, we have Prism Tower, which is based on Lumio City. Seeing as this was the central location of Kalos, it makes enough sense for it to get a stage. Prism Tower is pretty dang big though, so to represent it, this stage acts as a traveling stage. These basically have the fighters move to different locations in a larger area during the fight. This is seen in plenty of other stages like New Dunk City Hall, Skyloft, and so on. The stage starts on a big walk-off area in front of the tower. Walk-offs are generally bad since they lead to very easy cheese kills, but luckily we don't have to stay here for long as a platform in the center comes by to make us travel. From there, the platform just makes several stops going up the tower, with some stops adding in some more platforms. Eventually, the platform flies away from the tower to give us a view over the city at night. Once daytime comes around again, the loop continues. And yeah, that's basically what the stage has. It's honestly not that exciting at all. The stops aren't memorable enough. I think New Dog City Hall's design works far better for a concept like this. On top of that though, this doesn't really do a good job representing the Pokemon aspect of Pokemon. So far, every stage's hazards have revolved around either Pokemon or their types. Now yes, Pokemon do appear here, Helioptile, Magnemite, Zapdos, Amolga, and Yveltal can all be seen in the background. That's cool, but they sadly don't do anything. So yeah, I think this will have to go in C tier. There's nothing wrong with this stage to make playing on it excessively unfun, but compared to the other Pokemon stages, it's certainly the worst at representing the series. Series. Well, Gen 6 still has another chance with Kalos Pokemon League. Just like the Unova 1 we saw before, this is based on the place where you fight the game's Elite Four. Unlike the Unova 1, though, this is actually competitively viable. It's another flat stage with two platforms, but the platforms are much farther off to the side. This also has walls that go down to the bottom so you can wall jump off of them. Oh, right, Luigi still can't wall jump. As for hazards, I think this has a really creative idea for them. It's based off types again like Pokemon Stadiums, but the four types here are the same four types as the Elite Four in Pokemon X and Y. That's a great way of not only representing this game in particular, but the series as a whole. Sadly though, that does mean there's a bit of overlap in the typings. The four types are Fire and Water, which we saw before, and Dragon and Steel, which we haven't seen yet. Starting with Fire, two platforms will be placed on Fire in the middle, which can obviously damage the player. Fire will also be added at the edges of the stage as well. Now this can make it somewhat difficult to navigate, but the gimmick does make sense if you look at the Blazing Chamber in the original game. In fact, all of the transformations make the stage look closer to the respective members' rooms. This also brings back the mechanic of Pokemon with matching typings being in the background as well, but with a bit of a twist. Normally you'll see Infernape, Tapig, Blaziken, and Male Pyroar, but rarely they'll be replaced by Ho-Oh. I kid you not, I was sitting on the stage for 40 minutes waiting for Ho-Oh to appear. I'm going to lose my mind. This isn't just visual though, as each transformation will become more chaotic if a legendary is present. In this case, it causes the fire in the center to erupt upward, making the stage more annoying to navigate. For water, a massive river will come rushing down through the stage, pushing anyone off the newly created walk-off. Piplup, Waylord, Plastoise, and Clawitzer are the Pokemon that normally appear, but if Manaphy appears, the water will actually go toward the center, which will also kill fighters if they go into it. For steel, two swords will slam into the stage, which acts as both platforms and ways to damage fighters. Additionally, the center will transform into the Hazy Maze Cave entrance to make anyone who touches it metal. Normally, Kaklang, Steelix, Scizor, and Honage appear, but if Reggie Steel spawns, the swords will spin around, which will cause even more damage. Finally, the Dragon Transformation will cause a Dragon Statue in the background to shoot Blast out towards the stage. Normally, Garchomp, Hydreigon, Axew, and Dragonite appear, but if you see Rayquaza, it'll rush past the stage and attack anyone it touches. So yeah, there's a pretty good variety of layouts in Pokemon here. I like the additions of Legendaries too. I do think the transformations are a bit too chaotic for me personally though, but at least I had the hazardless version. I was really struggling to figure out where this one belongs, but I think I'm going to put this as a very high A tier. If you have an NS, I'd understand. It's got a great basic layout and the ideas behind the transformations are great. But I think the chaoticness does bring it down a tiny bit below the Pokemon stadiums. Still, I think this is an absolutely great stage to end the video on. Well, a video like this wouldn't quite be complete without one last stage. While we did cover everything seen in Ultimate, there is one Pokemon stage that hasn't come back, the infamous Pokefloats. This was a stage of Super Smash Bros. Melee, and it hasn't been in any game since. Now, this entire video, I've been talking about how these stages can implement Pokemon and their typings into the gimmicks to better represent the franchise. But what if the Pokemon were the stage? This is definitely one of the most bizarre stages in the Smash franchise, but that's also why it's such a fan favorite. It has this battle on giant copies of several different Pokemon from the first two generations. In order, we see Squirtle, Onyx, Psyduck, Chikorita, Weezing, Slowpoke, Porygon, Wooper, Pseudowoodo, Snorlax, Venusaur, Seal, Wobbuffet, Unknown, Goldeen, Lickitung, Chansey, and Geodude. Each of them have very different designs to make the stage interesting to fight on for the entire time. These aren't just static either, as many of them have unique movement patterns. Onyx starts mostly flat, but then tilts when Slida comes in at the left. Slowpoke is able to roll out its tail, and Lickitung is able to put his tongue back in its mouth. Wobbuffet and Chansey move quickly in and out of frame. The Unknown come in a big horde, which is able to represent several different letter variants. Each of these Pokemon are used to great 
great effect here and make the stage so incredibly memorable. Sure, it's not the most competitively viable stage, but I can't help it. I love the concept. It cuts right to the chase of what's the most important aspect of the series, the Pokemon. I really hope the next Smash game either brings this back or makes an updated version with all the new Pokemon. So with that said, I think this belongs as a strong A tier. Definitely a really good showing. But anyways, that's it for this video. Is your favorite Pokemon Amolga so you think Prism Tower is peak and I made you mad when I said it's mid? Let me know in the comments. Originally, I was going to do this episode on Zelda, but I suddenly got the urge to do a Pokemon version instead. Hopefully, you all still enjoyed it regardless. Let me know what other levels you'd like to see me do a video like this on in the future as well. But anyways, dry bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time.